my kind of thing I was consuming this week, uh, predictably, then is not a podcast, since I said I'd pretty much run out of them to listen to for the time being. It's, uh, well, it seems to be that time of year, uh, around sort of the early January bit, where people are writing their letters for 2023. Letters to shareholders, letters to investors, letters to, as far as I can tell, people are writing them who don't have a fund and therefore um, don't have any shareholders or investors or whatever. But nonetheless, letters to anyone who will read them. Uh, and the one that I've been looking at this week, well, I looked at a couple this week, but one of them was terrible. So the other one uh, that I've been looking at is Terry Smith's one uh, from Fundsmith. As you probably know, if you've listened to this show for a long time, I'm not a massive lover of Fundsmith for a number of reasons, some of which are to do with Terry Smith, some of which are not, uh, to be honest. Some of which are just, um, if everyone wandered around calling anybody the UK's Warren Buffett, I would probably hate them. But um, nonetheless, here are some things from the Fundsmith uh, letter to shareholders that have been standing out to uh, me. Um, I think, well, I, I kind of mentioned that I'd seen this, Stephen. You'd also seen it at the same time. But I'll, I'll, I'll run you through my kind of selected highlights of these things. Let's start with the kind of returns then. Uh, so the fund was up 12.4%. Importantly, this is net of fees, so you don't have to subtract anything out of this to get to the return. 12.4% for the year is what the fund managed in 2023. Um, underperforming the VWRL ETF at 17% uh, or so, uh, underperforming me at 21-ish percent, underperforming the S&P at 25-ish percent, and underperforming Steve D at 30%. But the only one of those that they compare themselves to, or the only one of those that they provide data on, is the VWRL uh, at 17%. So an under year uh, for them on that one. I don't know why that's the case, by the way. They say the fund is not run against any kind of benchmark. It's not out to be any kind of um, index or anything like that. That's fine. Um, but VWRL is a, a lower bar to try and clear than the S&P and to point out that they missed it by actually quite a bit. Uh, they only got to about sort of two thirds of the return of VWRL uh, last year. We'll come back to why that is in a little bit. Uh, the other parts of the letter that interest me are, well, the UK's Warren Buffett, uh, as he calls himself, or and other people call him, mostly other people, I think. Here is the big point that I always make, and I'll make it again because I feel bad talking about Terry Smith without saying this. Here's the main difference between Terry Smith and Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett doesn't charge fees to people who buy Berkshire Hathaway shares. Um, simple as. Uh, there isn't a fund, there isn't a management fee. You buy the stock, you own the businesses, you own them alongside um, Buffett. There's no, I mean, there are two sort of sets of shares. There's the class A and the class B here. Uh, and the main difference is the class A has, I think, say over where charitable distributions go. Um, but there isn't any kind of differentiated fee structure for uh, for those things or difference in voting rights other than a B share is smaller than an A share and carries a proportionally smaller uh, weight. But the weighting, uh, the the kind of number, the amount you invest in B shares to get the same is what you get if you invested in an A share, uh, effectively. Um, so yeah, there's a 1% fee on this and Terry Smith continues to stick up for this. He wants to say this is absolutely fine and people shouldn't be worried about this. And people are always talking about the fees and they should ignore the fees and they should just focus on the returns of the thing. I'm not sure I would be saying that in a year where the returns of the thing are... Uh, below VWRL by some margin. But anyway, uh, that's his, he, he continues to try and stick by this idea of charging fees to everyone. On the subject of their portfolio, um, then, uh, he points out, and I think this is a point that I liked about the um, letter. He says that the average PE of the stocks they own is slightly higher than the average PE of the S&P 500. Uh, and he says that's fine because... Uh, or he doesn't have a problem with that, and it doesn't automatically mean they're expensive because he thinks they're better than the average stocks from the S&P 500. And I guess, sure you do, otherwise why would you own them? He might be right, might be wrong, but that's probably the reason for, for owning those ones. And he does say that a high PE doesn't automatically mean they're expensive in the same way that a low PE doesn't automatically mean a stock is cheap. Uh, you might have a stock with a low PE that's terrible because it's going to zero, um, and therefore trading at nearly nothing, but like two times earnings or something along those lines, or its earnings are going to collapse and so on. And in the same way, we wouldn't say that automatically means, oh, look, it's cheap because it's trading at five. Um, we wouldn't, we shouldn't say it's expensive because it's trading at, well, I guess the lesson of NVIDIA last year would be uh, if it's trading at 100 and something. To be honest, if they double, it comes down. And if they double again, it comes down quicker and you suddenly look like you're in the right place. The main reason they've underperformed, I guess, is this big rise of AI, which has in many ways passed Fundsmith by. 
Uh, and that's okay. They don't necessarily have to participate in every growth, everything going. Um, but the letter read slightly, slightly sore loser uh, about that one, uh, to my mind here. Um, he was complaining. He said a Magnificent Seven, we don't own all the uh, Magnificent Seven stocks, and we would probably not be willing to take the risk of owning them, even if they all fitted our criteria. I didn't really know quite what that meant. I mean, he owns some of them. Uh, definitely owns Meta, Meta being one of their top performing stocks. Pretty sure he owns Alphabet and Amazon as well. Don't know about the others. Definitely owns Microsoft too, actually. Um, but I assume doesn't own NVIDIA or Tesla. That's fine, but I'm not sure quite what risk there is to spreading whatever your allocation for US tech is out over seven things rather than over three things, uh, or US big tech. I'm not saying you should necessarily lump your entire portfolio into it, but if they all fit your investment criteria, and that's a big if, and they currently don't, what the risk of owning seven rather than four, say, uh, is is it somewhat passes me by here. It gets you a bit more diversification, not massive amount more diversification because it's all big cap, uh, big cap, all tech and all US, but, uh, and all stocks. Um, but nonetheless, I got sort of lost out there. The real highlight of the piece, though, is um, him complaining that it looks like the market has decided who the winners in AI are going to be. Companies like NVIDIA, companies like Microsoft, companies like, to an extent, Google and Meta as well. Um, and he points out that, look, the market has decided before who big winners in various um, shifts are going to be. Uh, and that was Intel in the case of microchips and AOL in the case of the Internet and Nokia in the case of mobile phones and Yahoo in the case of search and BlackBerry in the case of smartphones and MySpace in the case of social media. And all of those have gone. Uh, they've been bad investments from the time that people thought they were going to be winners, basically, or underperforming investments to more or less of a degree. Some people might think they're better or worse. Um now so he says look we're agnostic as to uh who's going to be the winners of ai we're not convinced that um the market's got this right because the market generally doesn't get this right first time around and i think to myself kind of okay but are we going to ignore the fact then that nvidia's earnings not just its stock for the moment its earnings i.e the money it's generating by selling chips to well everyone possibly including the chinese right now have gone uh, per share have gone from a dollar 92 to uh, 4 dollars 14 to 7 dollars 58 in the space of 3 years uh, the the thing's more than tripled in terms of earnings uh, that's okay you might wonder about the durability of any of these things it's a fair question but it does seem like the market is reflecting the fact that look nvidia and microsoft and to an extent google uh, and to an extent meta and maybe kind of apple but less directly what they are doing is winning uh, at the moment. Um, and that's just the case at the business level as much as it is at the stock level. So, yeah, I enjoyed his grumpiness uh, at AI, uh, attempting to point out that that's why he's underperformed here and attempting to go sort of all stock market irrationality on stuff. It's an interesting read. Uh, am I tempted to buy anything that Fundsmith has to do? No. Um, I listened to their annual shareholder meeting thing during COVID because there was really nothing else to do. It made me incredibly angry. Uh, but I do like the point, and I intend to use this in future in my own writing, that high PE doesn't mean expensive any more than a low PE automatically means cheap. Uh, I thought that was a quite a nice little insight um, there, or a nice little way of putting the same thing. I get the impression he puts a lot of time and thought into his um, letter, by the way, so uh, respect for that. It's, it's the best... Um, I'm going to say letter to shareholders. You can call them letter to shareholders, letters to investors, letters to I don't know who. Um, that I read this week out of the two that I looked at. Anyway, Steve, you've had a look. Um, yeah, I mean, we're basically of one mind here, Steve, with this. I went through the same thing and sort of giggled all the way through it. Uh, and I particularly enjoyed the bit at the beginning where he said that, you you know, we, we've underperformed, but we were significantly less volatile while it happened. Uh, and it was like, well... That's that's definitely a selling point. Um, yes, you underperformed the market by like five or six percentage points, but we didn't have as much uh, down and ups uh, during the year. Um, yeah, that's that's definitely something, especially for somebody who uh, is keen to remind you of uh, how well they perform uh, the minute they don't perform. Um, yeah, they're trying to remind you about something else, um, which is. Uh, you know, by the by, I I would have much preferred him to skip that whole paragraph out and just to talk about the performance. And then he goes on to that nice paragraph where he just says that you shouldn't expect us to outperform the market every year. Um, you know, outperforming the market is something we will do over a 10 year period, not over one. It didn't need all the sort of whinginess at the beginning. And I think that's a little bit. I mean, Terry Smith has a, has a bit of an ego uh, and 
but maybe rightly so, Steve, because he's he's outperformed the market for a long period of time. He deserves his ego. But right then was a time to have your ego in check. And uh, I, I don't think he had it. Uh, they've hardly been humbled by the market as well. It, it's it's not like something that you would look at and say, look, you guys, you guys have done one percent, and the market's done, you know, fifty percent. Um, they've done twelve and a half, and the market's done sixteen point eight. There, there's not a huge gap uh, between the two there, uh, and it's not something that you couldn't make up in the early parts of uh, of this year if we have an accommodating market and you've got the right stock, Steve. So. Um, the other point about the the Mag Seven, well, he's got five of the Mag Seven, but he also has the next ones as well because he's got sort of Visa and uh, and Nike, um, uh, and um, he's got um, Striker, another massive you know massive companies that aren't a million miles away from sort of like top twenty stocks in in the S and P. So I can't really uh back him up there he's got a, a msci as well obviously that's a, another massive uh a massive company so and um, obviously mastercard um as well he's got a lot of companies in there that are like very very close to the magnificent seven or could be you know magnificent 10 if we decided to stretch it out a little bit um so yeah i don't really buy that argument and i also same as you didn't buy his argument with NVIDIA. It's okay to say, hey, look, NVIDIA went up this amount and I didn't own it and that's why it contributes, but it's all rubbish. But that's not the truth, is it? The truth is is that when the earnings follow um, the, the stock price, that's not hype. That is a company performing. Now, it's up to you to decide whether that company continues to perform or this is like growth pull forward that's going to retreat. Or this is growth pull forward and the stock's going to be stagnant for 20 years. That's up to the investor to decide. But it's it's, it's a poor excuse to say, you know, it went up because uh, and I don't own it. And that's why I fell behind. But, it, you know, there, there was no reason for it to go up. There was clear reasons why NVIDIA went up. Um, and uh, some investors anticipated it and some didn't. And it doesn't make you a bad investor if you, if you know, if something like NVIDIA is out of your circle of competence and you, you didn't anticipate that that huge amount of growth. Um, and, and, you know, and in the same vein, congratulations to those that do know the market and did know it um, because you've done very well this year. And, um, yeah, I just, I don't know. I, probably the same as you, Steve. I, I felt like this was a little bit of a whinge. I would have sooner he kept his ego in check and um, just got on to the, matter of fact reporting that he's got a wonderful fund with wonderful wonderful performance and he's had a singular bad year i think the point about volatility is very fun since he then goes on to compare uh his fund to uh, a bond etf uh and says look if you'd invested in a bond etf ages ago it's barry warren buffett by the way that's lifted out of the 2022 uh that's the shareholders from buffett but um if you yeah, if you'd bought the bond fund, uh, you would have done a lot worse uh, since inception or since however long than if you'd bought into uh, Fundsmith, and that's true. So he wonders then, well, why would anyone buy the bond? Answer: Because they can't handle the volatility. Well, okay, look, if not handling volatility is a bad thing, we shouldn't be making big, uh, you know, capital out of the fact that oh, hey, we were less volatile than the S and P, though we underperformed it by about half um, in in this particular year. Anyway, whinging about Terry Smith can go on for uh, some time. I assume you're not planning on investing in Fundsmith anytime soon, Steve, or indeed fund anything particularly? Well, I've just had the junior sip open for Olivia, so um, I am looking for something that I can start to plow um, some money into uh, um, on Hargus Lansdowne. Uh, I'm thinking uh, uh, it'll probably be a mix of. the uh, Aberdeen uh, Sterling Money Market Fund uh, will probably hold the cash. Uh, I'm thinking um, most of it will be in a global all cap. And then I've been eyeing up the Oak Tree Speciality Lending Fund as well. Um, That's a fund that over the last sort of eight years has stayed fairly static, but pays a 10% dividend, Steve, which is a suitable return for... Uh, a, a low end risk kind of um of position uh, obviously managed by um um it's not Marx, it's armin who does the uh, mm-hmm. insight show whose second name i wouldn't try to uh, pronounce when i can't quite remember it um but yeah it's uh, um a quite an interesting fund that i might pair with the uh, 
with the global all cap. I might just go global all cap. I haven't really decided uh, at the moment. I can't do anything because for whatever reason, Hargreaves Lansdowne hasn't been accepting deposits for the last uh, about 72 hours. So we shall see if that improves. That's interesting. You could probably buy their entire company with the kind of deposits you're looking at and the way their stock is going.